makes them want to do something different. And obviously we know that there's been these dramatic overhauls in what is a normal human diet in the last century that's accompanied industrialization. And it seems like a, a reasonably good first place to turn to to try to do something different so that you don't have the same kind of outcomes as uncle diabetes. And, um, you know, I think that's where people start. And so they start imposing various restrictions. They cut out certain foods. Well, if I don't eat ice cream or I don't eat fast food or if I don't eat, you know, salt, if I don't salt my food, then my diet is different from everybody else in the world. And hopefully that will spare me of some of these heinous diseases. And, um, of course, a lot of it is fueled by the sort of aesthetic standard that is set. You know, it doesn't take much TV watching or looking through ads to start feeling like, wow, those people look better than me. They're leaner and their skin looks better and their muscles are bigger. And, um, you know, what can I do to sort of make myself look better? Um, so looks and also fear of getting sick, people jump in there and start doing things with their diet. And when that doesn't work, you try something else, and then you try something else. And I, I, it's more of an escalation process that takes somebody from this tiny little desire to get healthier and be fitter and not eat as much junk or whatever it is. And before you know it, they've made it all the way to the point where they're doing, uh, you know, 10-day liver cleanses and water fasts and doing crazy things that can be extremely dangerous uh, for the wrong type of person. Um, but even minor dietary restrictions where people are they're not listening to what their bodies are telling. Their bodies are hungry, but they're avoiding, they're shutting down those instincts and using their minds to determine based on what they've read or heard on YouTube or whatnot or heard on television, they're using that to determine what they need to eat. We're the only creature that has any kind of intellectual dialogue in our heads about what we should and should not eat, how much we should or should not eat or drink. If an animal in the wild is tired, it lays down and takes a nap. There's no, there's no intellectual cognitive dissonance or interference there. So I think the biggest mistake that people make is they get further and further away from their natural instincts and they start letting this intellectual interference come. And our natural instincts, that's a well-oiled, million-year-old evolutionary fine-tuning product. I mean, we're talking about something that is very intelligent, that works in all creatures that aren't smart enough to figure out what they should and shouldn't be eating or who know nothing about carbohydrate content or calories. Those systems work just like breathing, just like you know, our heart circulating blood throughout our body. So to turn your back on that and to start to pursue things that go against those instincts, I think that's where people get off track most frequently. And it, it's well-intentioned, but it can lead to disaster. And I've seen it happen, and that's why my information has changed over the years to help people from, from having the same fate befall them as happened to me and many other people when trying to find that perfect diet. Well, you know, Matt, as you were speaking, I'm, I'm thinking, you know, of course what you're saying to my mind makes total sense in that we're exposed to so much information, uh, particularly nutrition information. And it's not like there's any lack of, well, I can listen to this expert, this book, this system, this diet, this approach, and we could be doing that for the next five lifetimes. Uh, there's, there's probably enough nutrition tunnels to go down. And, um, you know, I want to pick up on something that you said, which was, you know, listening to the body to body wisdom. And, and I know your work, research, has led you more towards this instinctive or intuitive uh, relationship with eating. So... How have your views evolved as you've done more and more research? And, and you know, can, can you help us understand what you mean by that instinctive or intuitive eating approach? Well, when I started out, it was, it was all just so simple. And because it was so simple, I was absolutely 100% positive 
in my conclusion. Um, you know, refined foods were bad. We needed to just eat natural foods. And if we ate natural foods as nature intended, then we were bound to, you know, return back to that Eden state or be like these wild, healthy creatures frolicking around in the forest. Um, so I started out with that type of mindset. And, I, and, of course, you can't read anything without being influenced by it. It's just not possible. So you sort of, your, your mindset changes by what you read. So I started reading a lot of Weston A. Price Foundation books um, that's put out by New Trends Publishing. I've read Weston A. Price's book. I read Gary Taubes' book. I read all these different paleo books. And at the end of that, you start to feel like not only do we have to eat these natural foods, but we also have to be awfully careful about eating too many carbohydrates. So you start to, it just starts to skew your reality. You start to look at, oh, I, I hear all these good things about coconut oil. Um, you start to look at coconut oil as this medicinal food. And, you know, if three tablespoons a day is great. You know, what if I had four or five or six tablespoons? Then I'd be even healthier. And you start to look upon foods more favorably. You look at other foods more unfavorably. And there begins the intellectual interference with your eating, and your diet radically changes based on just the seed of an idea. So my first, the first big thing I ever did with health was I was a longtime vegetarian. And then I, uh, I had some problems with that. I started my website, researched some more, and then I found sort of a low-carb, paleo type of eating. And it, it fixed a lot of problems that were created by this poorly designed vegetarian diet that I'd been on for a long time. Um, my digestion was better. My muscle mass came back. Um, I felt like I woke up in the morning with more energy, and things just felt awesome. And so... I started just preaching the gospel of, of eating a high-fat diet. And, you know, things were great for about six months. It's probably the best six months of my life in terms of my physical function. And then things slowly started to creep in that, uh, you know, I was trying to ignore because I'd, been, I'd become so infatuated with this way of eating and this ideology. And I was... I'd written a book about how great it was. The last thing I wanted to be bothered with was the idea that maybe, maybe this wasn't working out. But, you know, I got a few pimples and, and the sex drive started to falter. And then that waking up great in the morning with lots of energy at dawn turned to waking up at 4 a.m. and not being able to go back to sleep, dark circles under the eyes, bad breath, you name it. The list goes on and on and on. And so I started to have to adapt. Of course, I communicated with a lot of people who were experiencing the same and tried to research why would this be happening and kept adapting and adapting and adapting. And, you know, over the years, you know, I'll skip all the, the steps along the way because it's the long story. Seven years of uh, changes takes a long time to describe. But where I'm at now is that you know, people who go to health blogs and read health books and attend online health events like this one, they're not necessarily Jimmy Mountain Dew, Jimmy McDonald's who's on here um, listening to this program. It's people who are very interested in their health. They're trying to get as many nutrients as they can. They shop only organic. They do all these types of things. Uh, those are the people that have this kind of voracious appetite for health information. And I found that I had to adapt my information to really start telling those types of people that were finding me what they needed to hear, which is that they need to loosen up a little bit and that there are some major problems with trying to eat this perfect diet. And, um, you know, a lot of that shows up in a low metabolism and some other problems. And it's, you know, that's kind of where I've been led to across this big, long, wild ride. This big, long, wild ride. This big, long, wild ride. Stranger